So, ladies and gentlemen, welcome uh, to this morning's Evelyn Wrench discussion on the impact of climate change on the Commonwealth with three experts in the field, Professor Tim Benton, Jeff Arden, and Dr. Daniel Wild. The discussion will be moderated by Michael McKay. And I'm delighted to tell you that 95 people have registered um, to hear this discussion. For those of you who don't know me, um, I'm Professor Eve Middleton Kelly. I am an academic. I was at the LSC and now at Cambridge. And I'm a member of Rosal's Central Council and chairman of the Evelyn Wrench Committee, which organizes these events. Um, but before introducing our moderator, um, who will also introduce our speakers, I would like briefly to tell you about Sir Evelyn Wrench, who was our founder, and these talks are given in his honor. He was an entrepreneur, forward thinker, and explorer. He founded the Royal Overseas League in 1910 to broaden international friendship and importantly, to encourage strong debate over the world's most thought provoking questions and hard hitting issues. And we are continuing this tradition. Michael is a former chairman of the British Swiss Chamber of Commerce in Geneva, where he lives and now manages the speakers and events program and a non-executive director of MEC International Limited in London. Um, you can start asking your questions as soon as you um, wish using the Q&A function um, to send them to the panel. But please, can I ask you, when you send your question or chat comment, can you please include your affiliation and where you are joining us from to give us an idea of the geographic spread of our participants. I would now like to welcome you to our webinar this morning and hand over to Michael. Thank you, Michael. Thank you, Professor. Good morning, uh, good evening in whichever time zone you are. What an honor to be invited back a third time for an Evelyn Wrench lecture and a fourth time to assist the Royal Overseas League, my club of which I'm very proud to be a member. There can be no doubt that climate change is one of the biggest issues of our time. Some agree to disagree that it represents an existential threat, but no matter, it's a major problem that concerns governments, businesses, all manner of institutions, and of course, people around the world. It is a good thing that the Commonwealth, with so many sovereign nations that have coastlines and territories under threat due to climate change, it's a good thing that it's prominent in thinking and in action on this issue. I think about 45 out of the 54 member countries have coastlines. It's about 86 or 87 percent. This webinar today is proof. Our eminent guest speakers are further proof and the list of distinguished audience participants who've joined us today is even more proof of this issue's importance. So let's start. Each panelist will speak for about 10 minutes to set out his stall, so to speak. And before I introduce them to you, let me repeat what Professor Middleton Kelly said about the Q&A function at the bottom of your Zoom screens for written questions. There will be no oral questions. And I'll do my best to fit all written questions into the time allocated, but please don't be too cross with me if I fail. Now, ladies and gentlemen, it's my pleasure to introduce in order that they'll speak, Professor Tim Benton. He leads the Energy, Environment and Resources Program at Chatham House and is among many other things, research professor at the University of Leeds. It's my old stomping ground too, and lead author of the IPCC and the UK's Climate Change Risk Assessment. Then Dr. Daniel Wilde will speak ne next. He's an economic advisor at the Commonwealth Secretariat and leads their program on sovereign wealth funds. And lastly, Jeff Ardron is an expert on and the main architect and project leader of the Commonwealth Blue Charter, an agreement, as many of you know, adopted by the Commonwealth Heads of Government in 2018. He's also an advisor on ocean governance. Today, he speaks on his own behalf. Ladies and gentlemen of the audience, you'll agree with me I'm sure when I say how fortunate we are to have such a distinguished panel to address us. So let's start straight away with Professor Tim Benton. He'll kick off. Over to you, Professor Tim Benton. 
Well, hello, everybody. Uh, so I have the um, pleasure of giving the opening 10 minutes on basically a primer to why we should worry about climate change. Uh, I hope everybody can see my screen now. Um, what does it mean for people? The question I really want to kind of tackle is how will us as citizens of our various countries be impacted? And as you can see from the uh, opening pictures on the slides, there is a map on the bottom which broadly speaking shows the sorts of levels of warming we would expect in an on average four degree world where it's darker colors that's hotter um, and in the high latitudes northern Canada for example going up to seven or eight degrees expected global warming in a four degree world and as you can see uh, by superimposing the map of the commonwealth countries on the top with the picture on the bottom commonwealth countries are largely heavily exposed to significant climate change so just working with my uh, buttons. Okay, so let's just start off. Climate change is absolutely not rocket science. Uh, everybody knows about the simplicity of the greenhouse effect. What happens is that the sun uh, sends out a short wavelength radiation. It warms the earth's surface, gets converted into longer length radiation and gets trapped in the atmosphere just as in a greenhouse by greenhouse gases and that acts just like in a greenhouse to warm the Earth's surface. It's not rocket science. It was uh, first discussed at the end of the uh, 19th century. Here is a paper from 1896, which puts in place the, the science base behind it. Um, this figure is from uh, 1938, and it shows the first uh, empirical recognition that climate impacts are happening through global warming, and even Within the fossil fuel industry in 1982, Exxon provided an in internal paper that made predictions about the future and looking ahead in the 1980s, they pre predicted that in 2019, we would be about 410 parts per million of carbon in the atmosphere, carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, with a warming of about 1.2 degrees. And that's more or less exactly where we sit. So I, I think the first thing is that there is a strong evidential basis. The world, the scientific community, the governance community knows that climate change is happening. It is not something anymore that is in any doubt from a physical or an evidential or an impact perspective. So as you can see from these left-hand graphs, the top one is carbon dioxide in the atmosphere from, from Hawaii. What you can see there is over time it's going up and the thing to note from this is it's not going up more slowly in the last 40 years or so since we've learned about climate change. It is actually accelerating. The bottom diagram shows carbon dioxide in the atmosphere for the last 800,000 years. And the red dot in the top right corner uh, is effectively where we are now. So as you can see, unprecedented levels of change. But it's not just greenhouse gases, it's not just carbon dioxide. It includes a whole range of other um, uh, 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 gases that are, are important. Carbon dioxide largely comes from burning fossil fuel and burning biomass. Methane uh, often comes associated with fossil fuel, but industrial processes and processes associated with decomposition, particularly from agriculture, um, methane arising from cow's uh, digestion. Nitrous oxides, another important greenhouse gas, comes from industrial processes and agriculture, and there are a range of other things. So as we think about climate change, it's not just about carbon in the atmosphere, it's about this whole range of things. And actually, food and agriculture, because they're such strong emitters of methane and nitrous oxides, uh, is perhaps the most polluting industrial sector when you look at it in the round. So what does climate change mean? People often think about climate change solely in terms of changing mean temperatures and the world getting gradually warmer. But it's, it is, of course, increasingly as recognized about changing weather, but it's also about radical shifts in the climate that we might expect to come in the future. And I'll just talk through each of these for a minute. Uh, this is a, a big picture which effectively shows uh, in blue, uh, years that are warmer than, uh, the colder than average, and in red, years that are warmer than average. And the deeper the color, the deeper the, uh, the difference from the average. And this uh, slide goes back from 1850 to 2018. And what you can see uh, 
and a conventional graph is shown above is that you don't need to be a statistician to see how radically the hot years are grouped in recent, recent years and that climate change is very much a real phenomenon. But of course, as the climate changes, the weather changes and what we notice as the weather changes is that we're increasingly being exposed to weather that is more extreme as the distribution of weather marches upwards along the, the uh, x-axis. Um, and almost no day passes without some uh, uh, headlines being made from unusual weather conditions, whether it is Hurricane Laura today or whether it's droughts, whether it's wildfires, whether it's pest outbreaks, uh, extreme temperature, etc, etc. And it's not necessarily climate change that has the biggest impact in terms of mean temperature rise. What impacts on us as people and societies and the way we live is the weather and the weather is getting much more disruptive. <laughs> And one of the things that is becoming increasingly clear is that when there is bad weather in one place, there tends to be bad weather in other places. And in the old days, people used to think, well, if there's bad weather uh, in one place, on average, there'll be somewhere else that's suffering good weather. And what we're finding is actually no, a bad year is a bad year. And one of the main drivers for this is, uh, for example, the Gulf Stream, the, the jet stream, uh, which you can see in this picture on the, in, in the top, as the north melts, the temperature differential between the north and the tropics is changing and the jet stream is becoming wavier. And when it waves upwards, it sucks hot air from the south. And when it waves downwards, it sucks cold air from the north. And that's what creates polar vortices. So when you look, this is a map of 2012. Um, in 2012, we had extreme heat in the Midwest we had the summer that never happened in Northwest Europe, which was just constant rain, uh, agricultural yields severely affected. We had a drought in uh, Euro Eastern Europe, and that spilled over, the same weather conditions spilled over to droughts, uh, dry periods in Australia and disrupted monsoons in India. So the world is getting more interconnected and the weather is getting more unstable. And then the final point, just quickly, there is a re real risk that climate change will create a significant change in the way that the, uh, the, the world's weather works. And one example is uh, that we're spending a lot of time thinking about is this overturning circulation that drives the Gulf Stream. There is a significant chance that over the next 50 to 100 years, this will slow down and switch off. And if this switches off, uh, the Gulf Stream, we lose the conveyor belt of heat from the tropics to Northwest Europe. That obviously affects our weather in Northwest Europe, but it also moves the monsoon belt, so it will drop off India, it will dry out Southern Africa, and it will even dry out Latin America. So when you look at the risks into the future, they become quite big. Impacts on people. Well, obviously, we're all aware of the direct impacts on people. The four left-hand pictures uh, uh, you can see here are all from the same day in October, just highlighting issues, wildfires in California, Australia, and floods in Venice and the UK. But we're familiar with thinking about storms and wind and all the rest of that. But what I really want to focus on for the last minute is to think about the things that we don't normally think about in terms of the climate impacts. So coming from disrupted ecologies, pests and diseases emerging, locusts in the, uh, Africa and uh, 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 East, South, uh, East Asia at the moment. Emerging diseases, I can talk about this later, there's a good signal of climate change within the emergence of COVID. Biodiversity loss and the things that uh, biodiversity does, like pollination and fruits and vegetables are largely reliant on uh, bees and wasps. And all of these lead to disrupted societies through supply chains, uh, things becoming rarer in shops, they stimulate people movement, uh, agrarian and pastoralist farmers conflicting in sub-Saharan Africa at the moment, leading to resource conflicts. And all of these tend to be destabilizing from a geopolitical perspective. And just to, to end up, I think a key thing is to recognize is that weather change, extreme events rarely cause uh, societal uh, issues solely by themselves. And if they are, they tend to be localized but they act as a threat multiplier. And this is a figure from a paper I published a couple of years ago, just to show that actually the weather shocks con uh, combined with a whole range of other things that put the food system under 
pressure led to runs on markets, which led to poor policy, which led to price amplification, which led to food price uh, spike in 2007, 8, and 10, 11. Uh, the food price spike led to food riots in about 50 countries, including in Sub-Saharan Africa. Those destabilized people. Uh, we ended up with the Arab Spring. We ended up with large-scale people movement into Europe. That drove the rise of nationalism and popularism and in some small way contributed to, for example, Brexit, which is quite an important thing. So in conclusion, climate change has happened. It's going to happen more. Climate change will impact on our way of life. There are some positives from dealing with climate change um, and some less positive things like COVID. Uh, it will create extra stresses that will uh, cascade through the way our societies work. Um, we're going to find adaptation to climate change increasingly difficult as we don't meet the Paris targets um, and ultimately the costs will be so big we will have to find a way of changing our lifestyles. Um, final point towards the bottom, if we did act on climate change we can potentially make our societies much better, we could be healthier, happier and make the, safe, the world a safer place to be and everybody wherever they live, whatever they do, can be involved, and I dare say we'll talk about this later, in making sure that climate action becomes a reality. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Tim. That was great. You've really kept the time, and I much appreciate that. I'll hand over straight away to Dr. Daniel Wild. Over to you, Daniel. Well, let me first say it's a tremendous uh, pleasure to uh, make this presentation. Um, let me also apologize because I don't have any PowerPoint notes, so we're just going to get 10 minutes of me speaking for better or worse. Um, I should also say that the views expressed in this presentation on the economic costs of climate change um, are my own and not necessarily the views of the Commonwealth Secretariat. Um, that said, the Commonwealth is strongly committed to combating climate change. All 54 members of the Commonwealth are signatories to the Paris Agreement. And of course, the Paris Agreement commits the governments of those countries to limiting climate change to, two degree, to less than two degrees Celsius and making best efforts to limit climate change to less than 1.5 degrees Celsius. There is, however, strong evidence that we're not currently on track to achieve the Paris Agreement's goals. And that evidence comes from a number of strands and sources. Firstly, if you look at forecasted global emissions until 2030, it would be about 40 gigatons of emissions that was consistent with meeting the two degrees goal. Most of the climate change and economic models forecast that there will be 60 gigatons of emissions if we continue with current policies, the current policies in place. Secondly, if you look at global trends in emissions over the last 10 years, from 2009 to 2019, global emissions grew by about 1.5% a year. And obviously to meet the Paris Agreement, we need those global emissions to stabilize and then fall. And lastly, if you look at current and future forecasts of fossil fuel production, from a range of sources, forecasted fossil fuel production is above that consistent with the Paris Agreement's goals based on current policies. I think we can then also look at what are some, what are some of the main economic costs of climate change. And there are four main costs that I would normally emphasize, and they are the costs of extreme weather events, the, crop, the costs associated with lower crop yields, the costs associated with a loss of fisheries, and uh, the costs associated with um, damages to human health due to increases in infectious diseases. Due to time constraints and also the expertise of other members of the panel, I will mainly speak to extreme weather events. So there's quite strong evidence that climate change is likely to result in an increase in extreme weather events, an increased frequency of heat waves, droughts and floods, and also an increase in the intensity of tropical storms. We've seen a number of particularly devastating tropical storms in the Commonwealth, which have very negatively affected some of our small island states. So you had Hurricane Dorian in the Bahamas in 2019, which caused very extensive damage to two of the islands in the Bahamas. It led to over $3.4 billion of damages and led to nearly 30,000 people becoming homeless and completely devastated those two islands. You also had Hurricane Maria, which severely affected, the, severely affected Dominica, led to half the city being flooded, damaged nearly all the infrastructure in the island, caused $1.4 billion of damages, which is equal to over 200% of the island's GDP. So we're really seeing already some severe tropical storms, which have a very big impact 
on some of our members. I think I would also emphasize that, that the costs of climate change are likely to be unequally distributed both between countries and between people within countries. So it seems likely that climate change is going to have the largest proportional negative economic effect on countries in low latitudes based around the tropics and small island developing states. And um, that's partly because of the impact on human health and infectious diseases. It's partly because of the impact on crop yields. It's partly because of the impact on fisheries, which some of those countries are very dependent on. And it's also the case that within countries, climate change is likely to affect the poor more than the rich. There are a number of reasons for that. One reason is that the poor spend a larger proportion of their income on food and are therefore likely to be significantly affected by any decrease in crop yields and increase in food prices. It's partly because the poor spend a larger proportion of their income on out-of-pocket health, health expenditures and are therefore particularly badly affected by any increase in infectious diseases like malaria. And it's partly because the poor do not have the financial resources, be it from family, friends or the formal financial sector, to mitigate some of the harmful effects of climate change. I think we can then go on and ask why from an economic perspective is climate change happening? And I would say from an economic perspective, it's simply because fossil fuels are still a relatively cheap and relatively competitive way of producing energy. If you look at the levelized cost, the overall cost of electricity generation, when you take into account the intermittency of renewable generation, when you take into account the cost of connecting re renewable generators to the grid, gas generation is still a relatively cost-effective way of producing energy. Um, if you look at um, the cost of producing petroleum, at current oil prices, it's still relatively profitable to produce petroleum at a level in excess of that consistent with achieving the Paris Agreement's goals. And if you look at the costs of internal combustion engines and the electric engine, you would need an international oil price of $100 a barrel or more in order for those two engines to be cost competitive with each other. At lower oil prices, the internal combustion engine is still a more cost effective way of producing energy. So I guess the question then is what are we doing about this at the Commonwealth Secretariat? Uh, so, and I think that difference in relative prices leads to an underinvestment in the low carbon transition that you would need to meet the Paris Agreement's goals. So if you look at overall investment in the low carbon economic transition and grids over the last five years, it's been about $900 billion a year. Going forward, you would need investment of about $1.9 trillion a year in order to meet the Paris Agreement's goals. So you're looking at a big investment gap of about a trillion dollars a year going forward. So there's significant underinvestment at the moment in the low carbon economic transition. So I guess the question then arises, what is it that we are doing at the Commonwealth Secretariat about some of these issues? And we have five main programs, two of which I'll speak to in a little bit more detail. Firstly, we have the Sustainable Energy Forum, which allows different Commonwealth member countries to present their policies and international best practice to each other on renewable energy. Secondly, we have the Climate Finance Access Hub, which helps Commonwealth member countries draft proposals to gain access to financing from some of the larger funds for climate change policies. Thirdly, we have the Blue Charter, which I think Jeff will speak to in some detail. And fourthly, we have a program on, sovereign, on Commonwealth Sovereign Wealth Funds, helping them invest to achieve the Paris Agreement. And lastly, we have a program on petroleum taxation. So I'll just speak in a, a little bit more detail to those last two programs. Um, Commonwealth Sovereign Wealth Funds are large government owned funds. They normally invest for purposes of stabilization and the long term intergenerational transfer of wealth. There are 25 of those funds and they have nearly $900 billion of assets under management. And we think that those funds are particularly well placed to invest in a way which is consistent with the Paris Agreement and to lead private sector investments by example, because they're government owned and therefore they should be investing in a way which is consistent with the Paris Agreement's goals, and also because they're long-term investors, and therefore they should be able to look through short-term financial returns to the long-term. 
and we have a program assisting those funds uh, draft policies to invest to achieve the Paris Agreement by modeling financial returns under scenarios which are consistent with the Paris Agreement, by thinking about how they can divest from companies which are involved in fossil fuel production, and about how they can monitor the carbon dioxide emissions of their portfolios. We also have a program on petroleum taxation. We drafted a paper three or four years ago, which looked at the overall level of petroleum production in the world. And it concluded that you would need a 46% tax on global petroleum production in order to push oil prices up to a level that was consistent with achieving the Paris Agreement's goals. And that if you were to do that, you would get an extra $1.9 trillion of revenue for oil producing states. Now, there hasn't been any international agreement or pan Commonwealth agreement on the overall level of taxation on petroleum production. But what we have done is we've worked with a number of countries on a bilateral basis, looking at the level that they tax petroleum production. And in all the cases where we've worked with countries on a bilateral basis, we've concluded that there is scope for them to increase taxes on petroleum production, which would increase the amount of revenue that they receive, which would be consistent with lower petroleum production, which would be consistent with mo moving towards the Paris Agreement's goals. Okay, so I think that is probably my 10 minutes or very near to it. But I think I will uh, call it a day there and not wish you on for much longer. You're all very good at keeping to time. I think maybe you're Swiss and not British. Very good, uh, Daniel. I'm going to ask Jeff, Jeff Ardron now, please, Jeff. It's your 10 minutes. You've got the last word. Over to you. Oh, thank you so much, Michael. I'm just going to take a moment to share my screen. There we go. And then turn it into presentation mode. If it... There we go. Uh, Michael, can I just check with you? Are you seeing my screen properly? Yes, very yes. good. Yes. Well, first of all, thank you to the Royal Overseas League for um, hosting this event and for discussing this, well, incredibly important topic. Um, and it, I think the Royal Overseas League is well placed with your particularly international facing membership to offer a variety of perspectives, but also solutions to um, some of at least the issues facing us. My name is Jeff Ardron. As mentioned, I'm the Ocean Governance Advisor for and uh, the project lead for the Commonwealth Blue Charter. And yes, as was mentioned earlier, these are my own views, not necessarily those of the Secretariat, though as Daniel just emphasized, the Secretariat is very committed to addressing uh, the issues under climate change. To uh, paraphrase and borrow from Charles Dickens, I would say, and I hope you might agree, that we live in the best of times and the worst of times. We live in the age of wisdom and at the same time in the age of foolishness. And how are we going to address these contradictions is really the greatest tension, the, the great question of our time. The climate crisis is a crisis. I know that is a uh, evocative word. I don't use it lightly. Very conventional, respected organizations are publishing what I would consider very alarming information. And it is up to us to decide what we want to do with that alarming information. As well as was mentioned in, in Tim's introduction, Hurricane Laura, or whatever hurricane happens to be, the hurricane of the month, um, dominates our news. To the point that I think we're becoming saturated or habituated to this bad news. Um, and it gets bigger and bigger. The first picture I showed on the right of the screen, by the way, was from the space station. Um, this is just the news getting worse and worse. And um, on the right-hand side of the screen, you'll see the predicted maximum surge events. So the ocean, due to the pressure differentials and, and just the waves built up by the wind, will surge sometimes dramatic amounts, 10 to 15 feet predicted in some places in this current storm. And of course, that can cause as much, if not greater damage than the winds themselves. Um, I don't want to belabor the bad news, but just want to say that uh, there's reason to be concerned. This uh, infographic describes some of the uh, 
things that it ties in the ocean. The ocean has absorbed over 90% of the heat that we have or somehow has been created due to the climate change situation. So only 7% of the heat is still in the atmosphere. Most of it is in the ocean. And yet the ocean is largely neglected in the public discourse. Um, scientists are well aware of this, but I must say that even the International Convention on Climate Change, the uh, UNFCCC, largely disregards the ocean. And in fact, this is a big issue. And about 30% of our carbon emissions are in, also have been involved, absorbed by the ocean, which has created ocean acidification. Uh, not a good thing. Uh, I can go on that in more detail if you'd like to know. In terms of um, temperature change, we all committed to stay below two and preferably 1.5 degrees C. These were not just random numbers. Um, the scientific body of the IPCC published a very sobering report in 2018 that shows the difference between 1.5 and 2 degrees Celsius warming basically is the difference between having a few coral, tropical coral reefs left in our world and virtually none at all. Maybe they're wrong. Do we want to take that chance? Certainly by the time you hit three degrees or four degrees uh, Celsius, the ocean really fundamentally changes. I can discuss that more during questions. Again, I don't want to dwell on bad news, but when the majority of the world science community is giving you information like this, I draw your attention to my earlier slide, the difference between wisdom and foolishness. The Commonwealth, of course, <laughs> the ocean, of course, is a very important part of the Commonwealth. We have 54 countries in the Commonwealth. Um, 47 of them have a marine coastline. We have 45% of the world's tropical coral reefs. We have more than one third. I know this infographic says one third. We actually have 35% of the uh, coastline waters, coastal waters under national jurisdiction. Um, we have done some pioneering things like the uh, signed agreement between Mauritius and Seychelles that shares a section of the outer continental shelf and has a joint management plan. And eight of the uh, 20 largest marine protected areas of the world fall within Commonwealth waters. This is what it looks like on a map. Of course, the, the large, large pale blue areas are what are loosely called the high seas or legally areas beyond national jurisdiction. But if you look at the coastal areas, you can see that the Commonwealth is, has interests almost everywhere. And uh, it's a very broad, a very broad tent. So as was mentioned, the Commonwealth Blue Charter was indeed adopted in 2018 at the Commonwealth Heads of Government meeting here in London. I, I'm in London right now in uh, 2018, April. As a footnote, that meeting was supposed to be held in Vanuatu but was not held in Vanuatu because of Hurricane Pam. Climate change is affecting us already in a very big way. Uh, to get back to the point, the, uh, the, the heads of government of uh, the Commonwealth really welcomed the Commonwealth Blue Charter. I must say, uh, I was at those meetings and if I can brag a little bit, it was the only agenda item that I can remember anyway, uh, maybe there are a few others, I don't want to cast aspersions, but they applauded spontaneously um, when the Commonwealth Blue Charter came up and when it was adopted. And um, for these very sober sort of serious meetings, that is an unusual event. Um, there's a great deal of uh, political will to do something about the ocean. So what does the Blue Charter say in one slide? It's actually a fairly short agreement, but one slide doesn't quite do it justice. First thing, we agree to cooperate with one another. These ocean issues are bigger than any single government can deal with alone. The second thing is agreeing to take a principled science-based approach, all very important. In the Commonwealth, as I think you all know, we're a very principled organization. We look at things like rule of law, the um, you know, gender equality and, and so forth, protecting the environment. But finally, the third point on this slide is the most important one in terms of operationalizing change is that the governments have agreed to voluntarily step forward and lead these things called the Blue Charter Action Groups. And they would be the, uh, the champions of these action groups. And that is really the modus operandi of this uh, agreement. 
not many international agreements have a clause that actually says how they're going to be carried out. Often you just get these agreements where people say, oh, yes, we agree to do something about this terrible problem, and then they all go home. This is different. Countries have agreed to step forward and lead on this, and to date, we've done um, very well. Uh, we have 10 action groups, uh, led or co-led by 13 countries, and we have 40, I always get this wrong because it's changing, 42 of our 57 or 54 countries, 47 of which have a coastline, have joined one or more action groups. So 42 of 47 coastal nations have joined the action groups. I think that's very, very impressive. It does show what I uh, illustrate, what I mentioned earlier, the broad buy-in across the Commonwealth for this, um, uh, for the ocean and for the concern around the ocean. These, this infographic here is showing the 10 action groups that have um, come to being. And again, I want to uh, emphasize that these have come into being because countries themselves have stepped forward to lead them. So the first one, coral reef restoration, it was Australia, Belize and, Belize and Mauritius independently, by the way, came to us, the Secretariat, saying we'd like to lead a group on coral protection. And so we introduced them to one another. It was, it was, a, it was a very exciting time. And they have now begun a group on, uh, on this topic. Climate change, as I think you know, causes uh, coral bleaching. I showed you in the earlier infographic at 1.5 degrees C, we might already lose 90% of our corals. At two degrees Celsius, we're virtually losing them all, 99% or more, um, if the predictions are correct. Mangroves have also been affected by uh, climate change. Uh, storm events uh, can affect them, the changing climatic conditions, particularly rainfall and hydrology. Um, and they can also be a wonderful buffer against the effects of climate change, a wonderful buffer for against storms and other things. And so where we have sometimes removed mangroves to facilitate coastal development, we now find ourselves in a position of putting them back, trying to restore mangrove ecosystems. Uh, I first scratched my head about how uh, the Marine Plastic Pollution Group, the Commonwealth Clean Oceans Alliance, was linked to climate change. And then I realized, of course, um, in every one of these uh, storm and events that we get uh, on land, 80% of the plastic in the ocean is from the land. And anytime we have a bad storm, you can guess that everything washes out into the ocean, including all that plastic debris. So climate change events actually impact the amount of pollution in the ocean in general um, and plastic these days in particular. We do indeed have an action group specifically focused on climate change being led by Fiji. Um, its focus is mostly uh, political. It is looking at that question that I mentioned earlier in my talk of how do we get the ocean actually more in the international agreements. Some of the international agreements act as though uh, the ocean doesn't exist. And of course, it covers more than 70% of the surface area. More than 95% of our living space or habitat on this planet is actually the ocean. Ocean acidification led by New Zealand, again, um, a, a worrying problem, especially for shellfish growers. I had a, an earlier infographic, I touched on that. I can't go into detail in my 10 minutes. I think I'm almost up on my 10 minutes, so I'll just keep on going. Marine protected areas are an incredibly important tool to build the resilience of local e ocean ecosystems against some of the effects of climate change. Now more than ever, it is important that we protect some parts of our ocean. Ocean observations, I think self-evident. How do we know what's coming? How do we know how to adapt if we don't have any, any eyes in the sky and sensors in the water? Canada leading that group. Sustain, sustainable aquaculture, now more than 50% of the world's uh, food from the ocean is actually produced through aquaculture, not through wild fisheries. But the effects of climate change, temperature change, ocean acidification, uh, changing food supplies has re uh, really affected uh, the sustainability of aquaculture. Aquaculture can be a blessing or not such a blessing, depending on how it's done. Uh, it can, it has in the past, the shrimp farming has removed mangroves, but aquaculture can also help um, if it's done properly. Cyprus leading that group. 
sustainable blue economy being led by Kenya. And I think Daniel outlined some of the economic costs of uh, climate change. Not a pretty sight. Many countries turning to the ocean as a source of income. Most of our countries in the Commonwealth have much more ocean area and much greater ocean resources than they have on the land. And they're hoping to, you know, support their economy with those resources all of this under threat currently. And then finally, sustainable coastal fisheries. Coastal fisheries in particular can be hammered by climate change, particularly those associated with those other ecosystems I mentioned, uh, mangroves or coral-based fisheries. If the mangroves or corals go, of course the fishery, fish largely go with them. Um, so we have a sustainable coastal fisheries group led by Curie Bass. This is my last slide, and uh, this is a, a brief look at our team. Um, I'm in the center, but uh, a small but very dedicated team. Um, starting at the left of the diagram, uh, Sebaskar, our outreach coordinator, and Allison, who works on a um, well, variety of issues. She also works on some of the deep sea mining and natural resource issues. Myself, Heidi, um, next to me, uh, the Ocean Governance Advisor for the Blue Charter. And then finally, uh, Nick Hardman Mountford, who is the head of um, the Oceans and Natural Resources team and also uh, takes a very uh, large personal interest in the Blue Charter success. So that's me. I will hit the stop share button and hopefully you're all looking now at Michael. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jeff. You're all very good. Thank you for keeping the time, all of you. Thank you for fascinating insightful challenging presentations and i mean that in the sense that it's clear that there are no easy answers to this huge question but thanks to all of you for opening up the discussion so expertly now ladies and gentlemen of the audience as even i said earlier you can start writing as some of you have but not so many questions yet but some of you already written questions in using the q a function at the bottom of your zoom screen and I'm going to start the ball rolling with some questions of my own, general questions to all the panelists. First one to begin positively regarding efforts towards making progress on the headline of today's webinar. What are your insights and what are your experiences with regard to the principal components needed to get governments, and I mean the 54 governments of the Commonwealth, to work together successfully in one, reaching agreement on what should be done, and to action about actually doing it. For the benefit of those of us listening with little or no experience of such processes, it would be very interesting to hear your answers. Who'd like to start on this one, please? A pregnant pause, Tim, Professor Tim Benton. Thanks for raising your hand. Um, yeah, to avoid uh, that pregnant pause going on, on too long. Um, well, if we knew the answer to that, Michael, I don't think we'd be in the situation that we are in. Um, on the bright side, the Paris Agreement was absolutely unprecedented, but it took 40 years of getting evidence together before effectively the world came together to say, we've got enough evidence, we've got to move on to acting. Uh, the Paris Climate Agreement has two major things uh, in it as national actions. One is to have a long-term target, which is when do governments see that their countries can move towards zero net carbon, so eliminating emissions. And then the other aspect of the Paris Agreement is that nationally determined contributions of five-year carbon budgets. Um, so that's the positive news. The slightly negative news is that that mechanism is not working fast enough, as Daniel said. Um, at the moment, we're on course for well over three degrees with uh, current uh, nationally determined contributions. So we are not uh, on course for anything like equitable climate change. So what can we do about it? I think two things. We're w moving into a world where there is much less multilaterality, much less willingness to, uh, to cooperate between governments and much more competition between governments and the post Second World War Bretton Woods architecture of international cooperation is, is being dismantled. So I think the Commonwealth has a unique role to play because it does have the potential to bring together a big block of countries mm. to show some greater um, ambition 
and drive that into creating coalitions of wider willingness to move forwards. Um, but having said that, I still think uh, there is an issue that governments, because we pledge national well-being based on economic growth, uh, are still very much caught in the cost-benefit analyses, some of which that Daniel was talking about, that it's cheaper to continue in the way that we're going than it is to have a radical transformation of the way things ought to be. Um, ultimately, I think that comes down to how much citizens around the world are willing to empower their governments to be more ambitious, or how much citizens take a step back and just ignore the issues and hope the governments are dealing with it behind closed, closed doors. So for me, the action about actually getting governments to cooperate has to come from people saying climate change is hurting us, it will hurt us, we're willing to change, governments please work together to get this done. And I think uh, coalitions of the willing, as I said, like the Commonwealth, have a, a good role to play within that. Over. Thanks, Tim. I guess what was in my mind when I thought of this question was that the major qualification of membership of the Commonwealth is that countries have to be democracies and therefore governments have to carry their populations with them. And so in that respect, I was curious because you all are working with governments, and I know you can't mention governments by name, to give us some insights into what, what goes on in their thinking and how you best nudge them in the way you want. Uh, Daniel or Jeff, do you have a thought? Uh, just share with us your experience without uh, breaking any confidentialities. No, you're on mute, uh, Daniel. Okay, so, sorry about that. Well, I, I think one of the ways that you can nudge them is by showing them that it's in their interest, both in global terms for Meet the Power Agreement, but also in narrower financial terms. So when we're talking about some of the work on petroleum taxation I was talking about, it is often the case that you can go to a particular country, you can look at its costs of producing petroleum, you can look at its existing tax regime, and you can say, is this existing tax regime maximizing revenue for you for you and often the case is no it's not higher tax rates would maximize revenue for your particular commonwealth member countries and higher tax rates would also be consistent with lower production and would also be consistent with moving towards the Paris agreements goals so there are countries that will benefit from policies which lead to the achievement of the Paris agreement the other thing i would say is that the commonwealth is a very good forum for sharing information on successful policies towards climate change. The UK has had quite a successful policy on climate change in terms of reducing the overall level of carbon dioxide emissions by moving towards producing more energy from renewable sources. It's done that in a way which is fairly economically efficient by having a strike price through various rounds, a price that you guarantee to renewable producers to produce electricity we now have the Sustainable Energy Forum, whereby a range of Commonwealth member countries can present their experiences and their successes in moving towards achieving the Paris Agreement's goals to other countries so that different countries can learn from each other. Thank you. Jeff, what about you? Again, without sort of mentioning names, give us some, just give us some clues and insights into how you, know, you, you push things in the way you want them with, with governments. Well, actually, Michael, I uh, and you might find this hard to believe, but it's, it's absolutely true. We haven't had to push the governments. Um, there was a, you know, our secretary general talks about a, a quietly held pre-meeting to Paris where um, the Commonwealth governments actually agreed amongst themselves before going to Paris on that 1.5 degree C target. We were already there. There was no negotiation in Paris amongst Commonwealth countries to try to bring you know, ourselves down, we were already there. In fact, it was this two degree C that was pushed by other countries outside of the Commonwealth. So the Commonwealth can actually, has the ambition right now. Um, is it sufficient, to, is the ambition sufficient? No, it isn't. And so, you know, it's great to want to do something, but does that make you do things? No, it doesn't. The, the blue charter again, unanimously passed, not a whisper of dissent, it was really like pushing an open door. Does that mean that every one of our countries have now doing these great things for the ocean? I wish I could say yes, but no, because actually, even with coalitions of the willing, even when you have the political will that everyone talks about you needing, that in itself is necessary, but insufficient. 
to get things done. And so we're really at an interesting moment in history where we have the political will. The thing that people said we always needed, we have it. We have it right now. And my job is actually working with these countries who want to do something and beginning the laborious and difficult task of building the proper partnerships with experts, with other institutions, with implementers, with people who have ideas on how these things can be done, and then trying to find the money. And as I said, the ocean has fallen off almost everyone's radar screen with climate change. All those trillions of dollars of climate change money, almost none of it goes to the ocean. And so we have this we have very pragmatic problems facing us, but political will, for the most part, is not one of them. Okay, let's come at it from a slightly different perspective. And throughout history, man, Homo sapiens, has adapted to changing conditions. Often, they migrated to more benign places. Of course, it's true that the world's population is much greater now than it was thousands of years ago. However, what, in your opinion, are the hard choices in terms of behavioral change that human beings will have to make in order to survive on land and in our relationship with the oceans. Maybe you come back on that one, Joe. Yeah, I'm happy to. Um, you know, I mean, you're asking the million dollar questions and I don't <laughs> want to for job. a minute. Yeah, job. I know. I don't want to for a minute pretend I know all the answers. But I have some reflections on this, which is I think if you actually talk to people quietly and in a, in a, in a calm way about wasteful lifestyles, there are very few people who would argue that our lifestyle is wasteful. And maybe we are, can remember to our parents or grandparents or great grandparents generation, you know, and where, where things like yogurt pots, plastic yogurt pots started to become common in the supermarkets. And you would go down to my granny's basement and there were piles and piles of yogurt pots because she couldn't bear to throw them out because it's deeply ingrained in human nature not to waste. So first of all, I think it's a great, if I may say, capitalist myth that we are these consuming creatures and all we do is consume, consume, consume. Well, actually, I think it's very deep in our DNA. And my dog <laughs> wants to be part of this webinar. Yes, the dog can but I, I think it's, <laughs> yes, I think it's very deep in our DNA to not waste to live a sustainable lifestyle. And I think we're actually in opposition to some of our deepest instincts in modern society. What's your view? Tim, I see you nodding there. What's your view on like, changing behavior is my question. Yeah, yeah. Uh, um, Danny, or perhaps cover your ears because I'm going to talk economic heresy here. Um, <laughs> so I think the fundamental issue, you know, behaviors have changed, as Jeff has said. And if you think back two generations, the world was not as it is now. So we're talking about behavioral change in the opposite direction, in a sense. Um, the economic heresy is that we deem the best measure of national health and well-being to be economic growth rate. And economic growth rate is driven by consumption growth. And yet we live on a finite planet where there are finite resources and there's a finite ability of the atmosphere to absorb gases and there's a finite ability of the way to produce food particularly. So it becomes a kind of economic myth. If you have an increase in GDP year on year, that implies exponential growth in consumption rates. And we can't do that in the long run. And somehow we've got to get back from a human perspective to assessing our overall state through thinking about what improves our health and well-being. And over a certain level of access to GDP, getting richer doesn't, but getting richer through consumption growth drives a lot of the issues that we're talking about. So as Jeff said, I think part of the thing is how can we reconfigure our economies so that we have enough of the right things, the right sorts of diets particularly, that will make us healthy, but will also make the planet healthy. And it's perfectly possible. I mean, there's a, uh, reports in the UK press today about new government figures that solar powered uh, uh, PVC is the cheapest way of producing energy by far looking ahead. We don't have to have fossil fuel burning. At the moment, we've got lots of uh, sunken assets that it just happens historically to have been the cheapest way of uh, creating energy. We don't need fossil fuels in future. We don't need the huge footprint that we have on the land to produce an excess amount of calories that make us ill. 
obesity is related very significantly to COVID death rates, for example. So if we ate less, we would produce less greenhouse gases from our, if we ate less calories, uh, we'd produce less greenhouse gases from our food system. If we ate less meat, we'd produce less greenhouse gases from our food system. We'd end up being healthier uh, on average across the planet. Uh, and that is not to say that everybody in the world should be consuming less because, of course, a significant proportion of the world don't consume enough. But mm. actually, when you look at greenhouse gas footprints of rich nation states, the, ri the rich world, they are significantly higher. I mean, I think, if I remember correctly, one Somali is worth 17 Americans in terms of consumption. So it's mm. not really a, about a consumption change in the developing world, apart from to consume more but better. But in the developed world and the rich nations, it's about consuming less and better. And thereby we have to reconfigure our economies around well-being as an indicator as opposed to GDP as an indicator. Tim, thanks. Uh, Daniel, do, do, do you want to respond to that um, heresy that was thrown in your direction? <laughs> I mean, I, I don't think it is heresy. I, I would hope that economics has always been concerned with overall well-being as opposed to kind of very narrow measures. I, I do take your point that if you look at national statistics and what's quoted most often in the papers, it's GDP growth. Um, I do think it's worth questioning whether GDP growth is the best measure or the only measure once you reach a certain level of income. Um, and just from casual observation, it, it seems to me that beyond a certain level, economic growth growing at one or two percent a year is not the most important thing and is not the thing that necessarily concerns the public the most. So I do think governments could give some thought to whether that should be the principal measure of uh, economic success or overall success um, in society. In terms of uh, behavioural change, I think there's a question for people about whether we are prepared to build a world in which we need to travel less because travel does use up a lot of energy, both international travel and domestic travel, and not all of it is absolutely essential. And we're perhaps seeing with the current pandemic how we can use existing tools to not have to commute every day, to not have to drive to work every day, to not take public transport to, to work every day. And I think that could be a turning point in the amount that people travel in general, both in terms of how they work and their personal lives. And then I think there's a big question for consumers, which is, are we prepared to pay a bit more for fossil fuels and, uh, and use them a bit less? I mean, there are well-established mechanisms within our current tax system for making petrol, diesel more expensive. Are people prepared to support policies which increase their price from the current level? And I think that's a, that's a big question for the general public. Thank you, Daniel. Now, look, we, we, we're running, we have to run to time, and that's my job to keep us on time. We've got a lot of questions now. We've got about 11 questions, if you like, in the pipeline from the audience. So let's bring the audience into this. And the, I'll take the first question from Susan. Um, and she writes and asks, how can we as citizens and those monitoring the signatories to the Paris Agreement ensure that signatories get back on track to meet the climate agreement agreement target. How can we do that? Who'd like to take that first? Tim. Yeah, it's, it's a good question. Um, there is, of course, a three-way interaction between politicians being willing to act, consumers and citizens telling politicians they need to act, and market actors acting on uh, benefit of both of those uh, other sets of actors. Um, and I think part of the issue around what Jeff was saying is that we have some degree of political buy-in. We have some degree of market buy-in from some market players and some members of the citizenry are becoming more and more vocal. Um, we had the climate change conference last year in 2019 at the time when there was a, a political action by Extinction Rebellion in London and Greta Thunberg and the School Stri Strikes for Climate. And every politician that came to speak said that the world is getting in a different place and we're having to listen more because people are more concerned about it. So to answer the question directly, how can citizens show their concern? Well, they can change their lifestyle. Uh, as uh, Daniel has mentioned, travel less, 
uh, go on domestic holidays, uh, eat less, waste less, eat less meat, particularly a whole range of things that, that people can do. But we can all act as degree, uh, to a degree champions of the issue. Those of us who know about the costs and benefits of the future, we can talk to our friends, we can convince people. I do a lot of talking in schools and a lot of events like this. We can all act as champions and bring some degree of democratic visibility to the issue. And I think when governments are starting to fight elections on who can be the greenest, that's when things will change significantly. If we take a step back and we just ignore it and hope it will go away, nothing will ever happen. Jeff, Daniel, do you want to come in on that, please? You reply to Susan's question. Um, yeah, sure, I'm, I can. Go on, Jeff. I'll let, I'll let. <laughs> Who pressed the buzzer first? <laughs> um, yeah, I'm happy to take another shot at one of these. Again, very overarching and, and difficult to answer questions. Don't pretend to have all the answers, but um, there is some political will, as I said earlier. I may have overstated it to a degree to make my point. Um, the art of politics, of course, is the art of compromise and balancing many different things. And we may wag a finger at our politicians because one day they talk about, you know, protecting uh, the environment or reducing carbon emissions, and the next day they're providing subsidies to something that might do the exact opposite. This is all part of the political uh, game or, or just a life of, of trying to balance all the various um, interests of a society. So certainly from the citizenry level, always keeping climate change issues on the agenda is incredibly important. But I do um, somewhat take offense to this idea that it, it falls on people's shoulders. Listen, I do all kinds of wasteful things in my lives. Um, people who want to point the finger could point the finger at me and point at all the wasteful things I do. I do these things largely because societies have not been set up in a way that allow many feasible options. Um, anything as simple as just getting together on the recycling standards, what size of bottle could be used, what kinds of composite materials can or cannot be used. And those are clearly jobs of regulators. They're not very sexy, as it were. They're not very sort of headline grabbing. But mm -hmm. it's these kinds of uh, policy decisions that can only really effectively be done by governments working with industry. And, and I do emphasize the in industry connection there. Um, I've spoken to engineers at Imperial College who tell me right now that they exist viable biodegradable plastic technology. The problem is, is that until we regulate and say that plastic should be biodegradable and so on and so forth, there is no way that this technology is going to enter the stream. So we do need incentives, we do need policy changes that can change some uh, what we may think are intractable problems and they're actually not intractable at all. So to a degree, we can think our way out of this, but it does require a concerted effort by both citizenry, citizenry and governments. And as I said, just a refocusing of what we think is important. And if anything has good, has come from COVID and I don't wish to disregard the incredible pain that COVID has brought to families and loved ones. And I've lost some in my own personal sphere. Um, but if anything good has come from COVID, it is a time to reevaluate what is important and what isn't. And getting back to the essentials of life, you know, family, loved ones, quality time. And did we really need all that stuff? Did we really need all that travel? And let's refocus our minds. Daniel, a comment before I go on to the next question? I would just offer a brief comment that um, I think potentially the bind that some politicians may be in or may feel that they're in is that they know that the public wants us to combat climate change, but they're not quite sure if large portions of the public are prepared to um, absorb the costs that are associated with that. And I think that's one thing that citizens can do. They can make it clear to their politicians that I want there to be movement towards the Paris Agreement's goals. And I understand that that means that fossil fuels are going to have to be more expensive and that's something that I'm prepared to accept. And I'm prepared to vote for a party and support a party which has that as an explicit policy. So I think that's one point. I think the other thing that a lot of citizens could do is to look at their personal savings and investments and to check that they are consistent with the Paris Agreement's goals. If you've got a pension program, is that pension being invested in a way which is consistent with the Paris Agreement or is it being invested in an index which means that it's been invested in many of the larger fossil fuel companies. Okay. So they're the two points that I would make. Thank you, Daniel. I've got a question here from 
Catherine Monk, who's a professor at Swansea University, and I'll read it to you. Is Comsec still actively and publicly supporting the Iwokrama International Center for Rain Forest Conservation and Development set up between Guyana and Comsec in 1996? And I believe Comsec, she says, is still supporting it in some climate change areas. Shame not to promote this more actively as the key climate change research focus for Commonwealth. I was employed by Comsec in 2001 to 2003 as the Iwokrama DG. She, um, she expresses her affiliation. Who'd like to take that first, please? From Catherine Monk, Professor Catherine Monk. Who's going first? I, I think we're uh, both hoping that, oh, you're going first, Jeff, but very good. Jeff? Well, I, I was basically bowing out first. I'm very sorry, Catherine, that uh, I can't answer your question. My specialty is oceans, and I'm not aware of this because it's not an ocean initiative. I'm, I'm sorry. Daniel? Um, I'm going to have to say more, more or less exactly the same thing, I'm afraid. Um, my speciality is the, the investment work and the taxation work, and it sounds like a very positive initiative, but I'm not personally involved in it. Tim, what about you? Can you help on that one? No? Shaking heads? Catherine, I'm sorry, we tried. Uh, I'll take the next question from someone called Yash. Yash from the UK, he says it, he or she, I don't know, don't, I mean, there's no clue there. Yash from the UK, in regards to Commonwealth sovereign wealth funds, this sounds like your corner, Daniel, would local businesses within the Commonwealth states have access to investment in order to drive green business initiatives? How about that? I, I, I can give an answer. I don't know if it's, the, if it's a very useful answer, but it, it very much depends on the particular fund. So some Commonwealth funds have um, mandated rules that they can only invest outside of the domestic economy in order that they don't have any impact on economic competitiveness. So Trinidad and Tobago's fund would be an example of that. Other Commonwealth sovereign wealth funds like Nigeria's Sovereign Investment Authority, they can invest domestically and therefore they would potentially be able to consider Ooh. such investments. Anybody else want to offer a comment? I know that Daniel's the expert on that, but head shaking, no? Okay, next question is from Judith Ralph. And Judith asks, she, she compliments all of you. Um, oops, I've lost the question. I've lost the question. Judith, here it is. Thank you for these excellent presentations. No one has mentioned population control. We've all become familiar with the R factor for COVID. Is it too difficult to imagine applying this to the citizens of the Commonwealth? Who's going to go there? Tim, please. Uh, I bet, better take this as a professor of population ecology. <laughs> yeah. uh, uh, I think the ultimate issue is not population growth, it is consumption growth. And the two are very different things. As I mentioned earlier, you can have uh, the, the, the areas of the world where the population is growing are not the areas of the world where consumption is growing and greenhouse footprints are growing. Um, the issue is that you can have, as I said earlier, one American equals 17 Somalis. Uh, the American population is not growing, but if they can con continue their consumption growth forward, then it becomes problematic. So it comes down to an issue of per capita emissions from per capita consumption, and those do not necessarily well map onto population growth. And then the other thing is that the latest projections for global population growth are that there is a very significant chance that even in sub-Saharan Africa, the population might decline um, from about um, uh, mid-century onwards. So the overall, the, the kind of slightly uh, less positive uh, projections of about five years ago that would top out at between 11 and 12 billion at the end of this century uh, are possibly less accurate than the more recent ones, which are suggesting that we could go from where we're about 7.7 .7 at the moment, we could go from anywhere from about six and a half billion up to 11 billion into the future. And obviously, if the world's population declines, but our consumption growth continues, it doesn't become it doesn't become the solution that we should be seeking. We should be seeking the solution that our individual footprints, on average, particularly in the rich world, fall. Daniel, Jeff, would you come in? Jeff, please. Yeah, I'll just point out, I, I wanted to agree completely with Tim on this one. Obviously, 
more people, more considerations around food and everything else, water on the planet. But that's a secondary concern to the fact that our most developed countries um, have, as, as I think you know, the most industrialized, wealthiest countries have the lowest population growth on the planet, most generally speaking, and yet the highest consumption, the highest energy burning. And, and so I don't want to name names, but we know that some of these big industrialized countries pro, you know, produce the largest um, emissions. So saying that it's just the fault of too many people, I would say is an oversimplification of what is actually a very difficult problem. I would actually say that in some of our countries, we deal with some of the very small island states, for example, they don't quite have enough people that if they had a few more people, they would actually be able to get things done, that there's this idea of a critical mass for marketplaces, critical mass for getting things done. Um, so it's not an easy question. Certainly trying to keep our own numbers in check makes perfect sense, especially at a time of uh, when we're going to have climate refugees. Absolutely. But let's not forget that the real problem, as Tim has pointed out, is really our consumption of energy, our, how much we just like our stuff and, and our, um, yeah. The amenities of a high energy lifestyle. Yeah. Daniel, comment from you? You're on mute. Sorry, I was having issues with my yeah. computer there. Um, comment from you on that? No, I, I don't have anything to add on okay. that. I think There's that was a comments, interesting so question here from John, John Kelly, who puts the United Nations and the Commonwealth in the same sentence. He asks, this is from John Kelly, the UN and Commonwealth secretariats must have overlapping agendas. The UN, I guess, is hampered by the need for consensus across its large membership, so action is limited by vetoes. But maybe the Commonwealth can achieve consensus and hence action where the UN fails. Please comment on the UN versus the Commonwealth. Jeff, you're smiling. Do you want to go first on that one? Yeah, sure. This is a little bit in my um, arena. Um, first of all, it's not UN versus the Commonwealth. I, I know that the um, questioner didn't mean that, but I just want to clarify well, that so there's no antagonism. against the other, you know? Yeah, there's no antagonism here between the two agents. In fact, we have a memorandum of understanding and we work cooperatively with the United Nations, just to clarify that point. Secondly, my earlier point, yes, we actually did have a meeting before the Paris meeting under the, um, the Paris Agreement, which is loosely speaking a UN convention, though it's its own standalone thing. Um, yes, we share, um, uh, we all agreed at the United Nations on the Sustainable Development Goals and we work within the Commonwealth to meet the Sustainable Development Goals. And yes, the Commonwealth um, has a bit of a unique advantage. Uh, we're sharing, um, we're a smaller group. It is much uh, less difficult to uh, achieve consensus or near consensus. Some of the more famous climate change denying countries do not exist within the Commonwealth. So in some ways it is actually much easier to set an example and get things done. And again, speaking from my personal experience with the Blue Charter, this has been largely the case that we do have a number of governments that are actually very concerned and very willing to work. Now we have to put the other pieces in place, which is actually the how. How are we going to do this? How are we going to make it happen? Um, so there's no antagonism between the UN and, and the Commonwealth. In fact, we work, you know, we share the, the sustainable development goals and other, um, other objectives in common. But yes, the Commonwealth being a smaller group with fewer, with less chances of detractors or, or you know, um, holdouts, climate change deniers, we can get more done, I think. Tim, do you have a comment on that? You, I mean, you must have had experience with both, I guess, over the years. Yes. Um... As per my previous answer, I think in a world where we are getting less multilateral, if, for example, the UN was completely gutted and fell apart, how would we make global movement on these huge challenges? We would need to have coalitions of the willing. Mm. And as if the UN declines in its power base because it's undermined by various countries that should be nameless, um, who's going to drive that? And it would have to be the progressive states, Europe in collaboration with, with uh, groupings like the small island states, the Commonwealth, uh, overlapping uh, those, though those might be. We need ways of generating change and examples of change, as, uh, as Daniel, I think, mentioned earlier. We need forums where countries can get together and say, even if there are some countries that are not, not playing this game, this is what we're going to do and this is how we're going to share best practice and this is the success that we will drive for. 
Daniel, comment? I think I would just add to that that as well as the Commonwealth having a convening function, it also has a function of providing technical assistance to individual member countries. And there's a lot that individual member countries can do on climate change. You can have changes in tax policy. You can have changes in the way that you fund renewable energy. You can have changes that you, about the way that you invest in renewable energy. You can do all of those things as individual member states, learning from others' experiences, and receiving technical assistance from the Commonwealth Secretariat. And many of our countries are taking actions in those areas. Well, one, one question here from um, Russell Shackleton and, and asks a very good question, particularly regarding the impact on the poorest people and groups. What are the most effective ways, Russell Shackleton asks, what are the most effective ways to ensure that actions to confront climate change don't have the severest impact on the poorest people and groups in society around the Commonwealth? Who would like to go first on that? Tim, please. Uh, like Jeff, I have uh, absolutely no um, uh, benefit of being able to give you any great wisdom on this, because I think it is always the poor and the marginalised that suffer the most. And uh, it is poor and marginalised states that, if you look at climate risk maps, are often the ones that are most at risk. Um, and we can't say from the rich world perspective that, you know, Malawi or Mozambique with, uh, with Cyclone Ide last year, that, you know, that's your problem to cope with. Somehow we have got to find a way of equitable transfer of wealth from the north to the south to provide social safety nets that uh, low income countries cannot afford at the moment. Mm -hmm. um, and in a sense, however you cut the cake, climate change until recently has largely been caused by the existing rich countries. Mm. Um, and therefore there is a historical uh, moral imperative, I think, that we do some uh, helping the poorer countries to avoid the issues that we're asking them to do radical things to fragile economies in a way that will end up harming them because we want them to change. It's got to, they, the, the money can't come internally from them. Um, the way that the, you know, many countries in the global south make money is from extractive industries, which is exactly what, what we want them to stop doing because in a sense they, ha they have the biggest footprint. So we've got to find alternative income streams and we've got to help them do that. Jeff, regarding the poor, a comment on this? Well, first thing, always, think about what you have to do yourself. Meet those Paris targets, guys, right? If we, if we in the, the less poor in the wealthier nations just met our Paris targets, we'd be doing the biggest favors that we could to uh, the developing world. So, mm -hmm. so don't try to say, oh, greater aid, or greater this, and we can just keep on doing what we're doing. That's mm -hmm. not going to work. That's really not going to work. So just keep to our targets, do what we said we're going to do. That's my very first message. Mm -hmm. After that, you know, um, I, I do echo what Tim and, and Daniel said previously. There are lots of um, uh, economic levers we can pull right now that do this. Uh, support sustainable decisions in um, in your own government and in other governments. Have uh, have some ethics here. Have some ethics when we support projects uh, in nationally as well as internationally. Uh, I mentioned marine protection. Marine protection is a uh, insurance policy for every one of us. So I'll stop there. Daniel, any comments on that? Um, because an economist, the poor? I think I'd probably build on Tim's comment about a lot of developing countries being reliant on extracting natural resources. I think there's some important work to be done there about looking at where taxes are placed in that value chain and who benefits from them. So there's often a lot of talk about a global carbon emissions tax or something similar to that. That, of course, mainly leads to an increase in revenue for those countries which are consuming natural resources, for those countries that are consuming uh, petroleum, consuming, nat consuming natural gas, uh, consuming coal. You could have the same taxes, but you could have them levied on where the, where the petroleum or where the coal is produced. And that has an impact on global equity. So I think that's an important point. 
As the clock is ticking uh, on, may I ask one a closing question, if it's not too long? What is, as this is topical, what is the relationship between COVID-19 and climate change? Tim, could you kick off on that one? What is the relationship? Um, so again, uh, leaning on my background as a population ecologist, um, I did, used to do quite a lot of work on the emergence of diseases uh, back when I was a full-time academic. And if you look at it from a evolutionary perspective, the job of a pathogen is to infect individuals that are susceptible. And often as a pathogen lives in a host, the host gets better and better and better at dealing with the pathogen and keeps it under control. So there is always an evolutionary premium for a pathogen to find new hosts and new species. And as we change the climate, we are changing the way that uh, animals and plants live in their environment and we're changing their ranges and in general ranges moving north in the uh, northern hemisphere and south in the southern hemisphere. We are creating new ecological communities where animals, reservoirs, hosts, vectors of disease are all mixing in new ways. And on top of that, we are converting land primarily for agriculture. So we're concentrating habitat into smaller and smaller patches, which are often exploited by people in new ways. So we have a melting pot where there is scope for new interactions ecologically. There's scope for pathogens to jump to new hosts. We're mixing with them in new ways, and particularly in uh, parts of the developing world, that mixing becomes uh, unhealthy from a food safety perspective because you've got wildlife and uh, live animals living together get slaughtered in, in uh, conditions which are not entirely safe from a food safety perspective. And so there is contamination from wild to uh, uh, consumed species. So all in all, the, there's a huge bulk of ecological theory that says as we mix animals together through climate change and, and other means of mixing animals together, we would expect new emerging diseases to happen. And if you look back in the last 30 years, there has, you know, in the middle of the last century, people were saying, we have dealt with infectious diseases, they're something of the past. We will medicalize this, we'll get rid of them all, polio being an example. But since then, we've had HIV, we've had Ebola, we've had uh, dengue, we've had Zika, we've had swine flu, we've had X, Y, and Z ending in COVID. And they're all, annually, we're getting new and more infectious diseases, and COVID is just the, the last in a long line, which is ultra- um, infective and w mixed with our ways of moving around the planet um, has just led to this pandemic. So I think there is a good ecological reason for thinking that emerging diseases are going to become more common, not less common, as okay, we look ahead in the world of climate change. Last question. This one is for you, Perhaps Jeff. I could just um, jump in sorry, on that. Sorry, Daniel. Uh, sorry, uh, maybe Daniel. I could answer that from the kind of other side of the causal chain in that what is the impact of COVID on climate change as opposed to the impact of climate change on, on COVID. And I think there the picture in the short term is quite clear. You know, COVID has caused a decline in economic activity. A decline in economic activity is likely to lead to less emissions in the short term. And COVID has also caused a very sharp decline in international oil price. Very sharp decline in international oil price means it's less profitable to produce petroleum, means you're going to produce less petroleum in the short and the medium term. I think what's much, what's much more impact, what's, what's much more interesting and more difficult to see is what is the impact of COVID in the medium term and the long term. On the one hand, it, it might lead to less travel, less travel to work, less international travel because of people's concerns, and that has a beneficial impact. But on the other hand, it may lead to a movement towards private transport because people are less comfortable traveling on public transport because of the risk or perceived risk of infection on public transport. And it is also the case that in the medium term and the long term, if the low oil price is sustained, then obviously that increases um, the gap between the cost effectiveness of fossil fuels and the cost effectiveness of renewables and electric engines. And how that will play out in the medium term, I think will be very interesting to watch. And thanks, um, Jeff. Uh, there's one last question. I'm not sure if you can deal with it fairly quickly because um, it's now 26 minutes past the hour. Isn't it the case, Jeff, that the sea, the oceans, have tremendous powers of self-healing? Why is now so different? And as some would point out, alarming. Okay, thanks, Michael. I'll try to be brief on that. Yes. The short answer is yes. 
the ocean um, does have an incredible uh, power to regenerate itself. Why now? Because frankly, we've been ignoring it <laughs> for our entire history. Um, at the beginning of uh, the previous century, the 1900s, um, the, uh, a very respected scientist, uh, part of the Royal Society, um, a man who was otherwise eminent and, and a brilliant man, um, thought that the fisheries of the ocean were inexhaustible. And he went down on the record saying the fisheries are inexhaustible. There's no way we could overfish the fisheries. I'm not trying to poke fun. I'm not even going to name his name because he was wrong. And he was wrong not because he was an idiot, but because we couldn't imagine it. We simply couldn't imagine, even the, one of the best scientists of our age couldn't imagine the state that we are in now. That's why, because we've disregarded the signs up until now, and now we are at this stage where believe it or not, the oceans can't take much more. But That's... if we do, yeah, if we do protect them, just a little bit more people, they will largely heal themselves. The stopwatch is merciless. I just want to thank the audience um, for fielding the questions. Please forgive me, members of the audience, if I didn't live up to your expectations. Thank you for all your questions. And it's my pleasure now to hand over to Eve to conclude this webinar. Eve, over to you. Thank you very much indeed, Michael. Um, my last and most pleasurable task is to thank you all. So I would like to thank our three speakers, Jeff Arden, Tim Benton, Daniel Wilde, and our moderator, Michael McKay, um, for offering us your deep expertise on a topic that will have a very profound impact on our planet and on humanity for generations to come. Um, what we asked of them was a balanced discussion with a realistic assessment of the threats and the risks, but also what is being done to address them. And I really think, and I hope you agree with me, um, that they have achieved um, that balanced view. So thank you all very much indeed. And obviously the, the Russell staff for making this webinar available. There will be a recording of this um, discussion and it will be available on the um, website. The last thing I wanted to do is to say, as you know, these webinars uh, are currently free. However, we would be grateful if you would like to make a donation, please, to help support our ongoing work on our arts and education projects. So please do so. Uh, by going to the supporters page on the website. It is now on your screen. And also I know that many of, um, there were many non-members as part of the audience who have joined us today. You are of course very welcome. And if you would like to know more about how to join Rosal, again, the email is there. Thank you all very much indeed for another wonderful um, webinar and please keep a look out for the future ones. We have a wonderful, a, a really exciting one coming in November on, on China. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you. Goodbye.